when the church is sick of love. May this never happen to us because we have just prayed to the Lord, we stretch our hand to him. It would be terrible for us to be separated from him. But there is such a thing as being sick of God's love. Believers who compose God's church have been redeemed from corruption. It was in reference to the Hebrews, Israel, in the Old Testament, that we get a very vivid description of how God redeemed his church from corruption. If we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, we read here where God found his people. Deuteronomy 32, verses 9 and 10, and how his church was redeemed from that position. Deuteronomy 32, 9 and 10. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. We can read verse 11 and 12 to broaden that frame. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. God found his church in the wilderness, in the howling wilderness. He redeemed them from Egyptian captivity. He brought them into a secure place with him. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, we have more detail of the kind of redemption, the kind of um, love that God had to his church and has to his church in the different periods of time launched out there in Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16, verses 5 onward. Here is the description of the pit from which his people are redeemed. It says, None I pitied thee, to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, Live. Yea, I said unto thee when thou wast in thy blood, Live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts were fashioned, and thine hair is grown whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. 
Then washed I thee with water, yea, I truly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger's skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. He was a symbolic description of how God raises his church from the gutter, from its pollution. The people, every believer who has become part of God's church has come from a corruptible background. And he has raised up a people throughout the ages, as is described there, he puts his skirt around her, and that's his beautiful righteousness, and he makes her his own. He makes a covenant with her, and she is brought forward by his comeliness, by his righteousness, to stand as a church to his glory. He has taken her from the pit of corruption. Isaiah 38, verse 17. Isaiah 38, verse 17. Behold, here was the condition of the church in Egypt, the church in the wilderness. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. All God's, all the sins of the people God has cast behind his back. In the process that we studied in the Sabbath school lesson this morning, justification. All sins cast behind him. And this amazing work that we have been reading here as short as possible, just to picture in our mind that God's people have been redeemed from the pit of corruption, that this amazing redemption that can be enlarged in our meditation cost heaven dearly. we are told that God spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all. He spared not his son. And I'd like us to spend some time this morning to meditate a while on God not sparing his son, not sparing all the securities of heaven for such a people who were so depraved. Let's meditate in Isaiah 53. Not just for information's sake, but to read this to appreciate what cost was expended for the church. Isaiah 53, commencing from verse 1, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, There is no beauty that we should desire him. 
Here is the reference to Jesus coming from the ivory palaces of heaven into this dark world and he grows up out of a dry ground. Nothing by way of earthly glory. In fact, we know so well how he was born in a stable. What a contrast from heaven to earth. But then as he continued to develop in the city of Nazareth, didn't have a good name, nothing there. And then as he continued, he is despised, verse 3, and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. These words are for us to spend time to meditate upon, to realize what it cost heaven, what it cost the Father the Son, to pick the people up from their degradation, to take them into a condition, as it was described there, as a queen dwelling with beautiful clothing, with beautiful gems, all symbolic of the spiritual righteousness that was imparted to the church. The meditation of what Jesus went through, he appeals to us to let it sink deep. We have often quoted Lamentations 1, and I do it again because this is always important for us to hear this, this lamentation of Jesus as he was burdened with the sins of the people that he was washing them by, from those sins by his blood. Lamentations 1.12, Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Behold and see, if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. From above hath he sent fire into my bones, and it prevaileth against them. He hath spread a net for my feet. He hath turned me back. He hath made me desolate and faint all the day. The yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. 
They are wreathed and come up upon my neck. He has made my strength to fall. The Lord has delivered me into their hands from whom I am not able to rise up. As you connect these words to Isaiah that we were reading in 53, Jesus came to wash the church of her blood, to cleanse her, to lift her up, and this is what it cost him. To redeem us from the pit of corruption, Jesus had to go through experiences that were a living horror to him. Just what the church is meant to experience if it would not have been for his mercy. Here we are told in Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1147, paragraph 4, that we should think of Christ's humiliation. Think of Christ's humiliation. He took upon himself fallen, suffering human nature degraded and defiled by sin. He took our sorrows, bearing our grief and shame. He endured all the temptations wherewith man is beset. He united humanity with divinity. A divine spirit dwelt in a temple of flesh. He united himself with the temple. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Because by so doing, he could associate with the sinful, sorrowing sons and daughters of Adam. He could associate and drink our misery with us. It cost him severely. And as we permit this to sink in, as we meditate upon it, that this is for me, so that I can be part of his pure church, he's going to have a church that is pure, but he found her in this condition. And he took upon himself all those powerful realities of the guilt and the degradation that they were in the pit with. Romans chapter 8 now needs to be absorbed in the light of what we have been reading. Romans 8, 31. Romans 8, 31 and part of 32. It says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, there it is. He that spared not his son from what we have been reading about, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also Freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? There is so much to absorb here that we would actually receive the precious meditation as we feast upon these realities that he spared not his own son. He delivered him up to everything we have been reading there. And as we stop to think what that meant, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. 
all things. All heaven is given us for what he did for us. And are we to carry guilt? Are we to, to respond to any charge that has been laid upon us by any man? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Today we live in a world, in a culture of blame. They want retribution. They want, they want to destroy the image of people who have been powerful lights in the world. Because they can search through and find all sorts of things, true or untrue, to bring them to the forefront. We have a meditation here that removes all the condemnations that come upon God's people. For many things that God's people have done in the past have been described. That's why Jesus came and took it all away. When the Pharisees were ready to stone the woman caught in adultery, Jesus had to remind them, are you any better? There is not a, certain, a single person on this planet who is not in the gutter of sin. Not a single person. And Jesus has redeemed a people by his wonderful gift. And so, as we were reading in our scripture reading, he brought me into the banqueting house and his banner over me is love. Indeed. Why did he do all this? Why did he sacrifice so much for a vile, blood-covered, corrupt people. Why? If we come over to Proverbs, it's written, Proverbs 17, verse 9. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. That's what it's about. He is seeking love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. You know how true that is. Even families become separated because they repeat a matter. But he is, through his wonderful sacrifice, God is covering a transgression. Why? Because the margin reads, he procureth love. The person who is taken from the gutter and knows what a sinner he is, and he sees what God has done for him, that person, something happens inside. And you realize, I'm not worthy of any of this amazing work. And then he wakes up. Oh, he wants to lift me into the glory of what we were describing there, dressed in beautiful garments and with jewelry, etc., spiritually speaking. And the heart is drawn out to him. He procureth love. Or he evokes love. He brings it about. He obtains it through this amazing story. And I want to read here in the meditation of this. In uh, Manuscript Releases, Volume 12, 12 MR, page 115, paragraph 1 says, in order to secure us to himself 
and ensure our eternal salvation, he gave all that he had. His riches, his glory, and his own precious love. All heaven was given so that we might be secure in salvation. For us, he endured the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane when the mysterious cup trembled in his hand and his anguished soul cried out, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. From his pale, quivering lips came this anguished prayer and then the words of submission, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. An angel from heaven strengthened the royal sufferer to tread his blood-stained path to Calvary and to drink the cup of suffering to its very dregs. Oh, why was all this suffering, this ignominy and torturing agony? Why? It was that by his, by this sacrifice of himself, his love may stand revealed that he might woo men from the ways of sin. After man has cost so much, will he leave him now? After it cost so much for Jesus, mankind has cost so much, will he leave him? Oh, no, no. He is faithful that has promised. His arms are outstretched to clasp the repentant, believing ones to his heart of love with all the tenderness of divine affection. In Jesus, we have an enduring, unchanging friend and though all earthly prospects should fail and every earthly friend prove treacherous, yet he is faithful still. He woos us to himself. He woos. He woos our love. He evokes us to appreciate his love. And indeed, this is what the Apostle John in 1 John 4.19 says. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. He ha we love him in consideration of this amazing work of drawing us out of this murky pit. This is all the same thing as a young man who wants to woo his bride. The symbol is very much on the same vein. It's just that this bridegroom has paid so much. And the way that Jeremiah puts it in Jeremiah 31, verse 3, Jeremiah 31, verse 3, it says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee, wooed thee. God commendeth his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, he did this. And that's the wooing love, the power of what Jesus suffered, that I should have suffered and there in Isaiah 62, 5, 
As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. That's his church, his bride. A people who come together because of his saving grace that he has brought each individual from the murky pit from which they have been taken. And so he comes to his bride. He comes to his bride in these last days in the Laodicean period. He comes to his bride and he's knocking. Revelation 3 verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This valiant bridegroom comes to the people whom he has redeemed. And he is speaking here to the Laodicean church, which he has said that to the angel of the church, you don't even know how wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked you are. And I'm going to spew you out, but I'm standing at the door. If any man will open the door, I will come to him and will sup with him. The bride, the Laodicean church. Jesus is ascribing the picture of Song of Solomon 5, verses 2 to 6 to them. Let's read it there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here is the picture that he got it from in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 5. He inspired these words of Solomon so that he can then appeal to his church in the last days. Song of Solomon 5. Reading there in verses 2 through to 6. Here she is. I sleep but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. What's he talking about? his Gethsemane experience, where the dew was upon him because he was praying there, suffering for her. So he reminds her of this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you love me? Oh, what does she answer? Oh, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? And so she's there lingering. This is too uncomfortable to get up out of bed because the doorknob is on the inside, not on the outside. She can't just say, come in. Jesus is waiting for her to open. And while he's waiting for it, he was wondering, well, maybe I can get my hand in that hole and try to get to the latch. And that's what it says, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door and my bowels were moved for him. Here was an extra special sort of a thing. He had already paid the price for her. She was already his bride, but he, she was there all lazy-like, Laodicean. And he's there trying to get in. And as she she sees him doing that, she goes, oh no, this is too much. So I rose up to open to my beloved. 
And as she rose up, my hands drooped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. Can you see her languidly trudling towards the door and then languidly opening the latch? She's been waiting a long time, you know, just not answering as quickly. And what happens? Verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. Can you see what we were singing in our hymn in the beginning? Where we read, sung there, As in grace he calls again, O oh, today is time accepted, later you may call in vain. You may call in vain. And that's what happened to this woman, to this church. She called, but he wasn't there anymore. And she began to wander through the streets. Indeed, this is the Laodicean bride. The church that made a high profession, that had been lifted high. And Revelation 3 verses 15 to 17 is Christ's words to her. You say, you are rich and increased with goods. You are lukewarm. You are lethargic. You're not on fire for me anymore. Something has gone awry. This particular condition of the church, this ministry, this angel of the church that he says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Let's read it there in Revelation 3, verse 15 to 17. Revelation 3, verses 15 to 17. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. She was lying in her bed, still feeling for him, but she wasn't hot enough to jump out of bed and open the door. I wish you were cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What is meant with this are in the words of Jesus in Matthew In Matthew chapter um, 25, Matthew 25, verses 48 to 51. This is the description in, in application, in detail, because this ministry is written of here by, by Jesus, verse 48, but, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Leo decision, decision uh, ministry, which finally, because it has not got the perfect in, um, indwelling of Christ there, she is languidly going to the door to open it to let him in. Well, what does she do? Come back to Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, 
5, verse 7 and 8 now. Song of Solomon 5, verse 7 and 8. Remember, she called, verse 6, but he gave no answer. The watchman that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. I am sick of love. Now this is what she finally says. He's gone because of her fault. She didn't come and show him powerful faithfulness to run to the door. She was so comfortable in her own bed, in her own Laodicean condition. So he withdrew himself. And now she is running out into the streets and she's coming to the other daughters, the other churches, and she starts to fraternize with them. And she says, you know, can you find him, please? I want to, f- I want to get back with him. Uh, and they turn around and they say interesting things. Verse 9, What is my beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. What is my, thy beloved more than another, beloved, that thou dost so charge us? You see, this is the way they reason then when they are not in harmony with Jesus. They say, well, you see to that yourself. You know, you love Jesus, you love him, well, you know, what's your love any better than the others? You see, because the other churches have fraternized with other gods. And this is what... Jesus said about the servant that it's eating and drinking with the drunken, saying in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. We read here from Bible Commentary, Volume 7, as we try to appreciate this language of the woman, of the bride. 7 BC, 962, paragraph 6 says this, Love of self excludes the love of Christ. Those who live for self are ranged under the head of the Laodicean church who are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. The ardor of the first love has lapsed into a selfish egotism. The love of Christ in the heart is expressed in the actions. If love for Christ is dull, the love for those for whom Christ has died will degenerate. There may be a wonderful appearance of zeal and ceremonies, but this is the substance of their self-inflated religion. Christ represents them as nauseating to his taste. What has happened? The love that, stu- that brought this woman to such a high position has gone into self-love, into the comforts of their own riches that have been multiplied to them. Love of self excludes the love of Christ. That's what we read. The ardor of the first love has lapsed into a selfish egotism. What happens to a, to a bride who has lost her fascination, her absolute devotion to her husband or to her bridegroom? She starts to see things from a totally different perspective. Ego. And so what does she say? I am sick of love. 
How is this possible? That the love grows cold like that? How is it possible to be lukewarm? There was another rendition of this in Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 in Ephesians, the, the, church, the church of Ephesus. I have somewhat against thee, thou hast lost thy first love. And in Jesus' words in Matthew 24, verses 11 to 13, and especially in verse 12, because iniquity abounds, what happens? The love of many grows cold. Egotism, self-indulgence takes over. And when the Jesus they loved with such intense love has worn down and yet they feel that there is still something attractive about him and they languidly go to open the door, they find it's too late. And I just want to conclude this message with the counsel of God's word to prevent such a condition to happen to you and me. Examine the process by which we become tired of God's love. How does that happen? We've just had a little introduction there to the thought of egotism and so on. But what will bring this about that God's love becomes sick to the, to the church? What does God's love lead to? What was that? Let's read it now. 1 John 5. Because the woman has been so touched by God's love, she was brought out of the pit, she was dressed in beautiful apparel, etc., etc. Myrrh and so on, these were all beautiful fragrance. 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Here is what... God's love has started in the woman. It says, verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous, what is the love of God? That we keep his commandments. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. How is it in today's Christian world? In today's Christian churches, including the Laodicean people, what is happening in their ranks. It's the lament of Psalm 119, verse 126. The, the, the genuine believer is crying to God, the one who is truly hot for him, is crying in Psalms 119, verse 126. It says... It is time for thee, Lord, to work. Why? For they have made void thy law. This is the reality of Christianity today. The churches, the different varieties of women that are recorded that have come through the history to our time, they have once been redeemed and they have become cold, have lost their first love. And what is described about them here? The law that has been their, has been their fascination because of the love of God, that law has been made void. If you love me, keep my commandments. And when you uphold the law of God before the people today, they will say, when it comes to the Sabbath, no, that was done away with. 
when it comes to war, no, no, that's, that's not, you know, we, we have to go to war. Uh, when it comes to marriage, the divorce, marriage situation, no, 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 that's not so important anymore. And it goes from one subject to the other. The, the law has been made void. If you break one, you break them all, remember? And so the sinner who is continually being helped by Jesus to recover from that becomes alive and hot for the law of God. But in trying to keep the commandments of God, in motivated by the love of God to keep that law, is a crucifying experience to the flesh. The flesh does not enjoy keeping God's law. Galatians 5.17 is the description of this in the Christian's life. Where it says very emphatically, there is a warfare between the spirit and the flesh. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Inside of the Christian, there is flesh and there is spirit. And the experience is one of conflict within. They are motivated by the love of God to keep the law. But the flesh is making it hard. The temptations of the flesh. It's a crucifying experience to follow Jesus and to follow his crucifixion of self. And slowly the church members forget the love or feel uncomfortable with a love that is making them uncomfortable. We read about it in manuscript releases. Volume 14. That's volume 14 of manus. Sorry, not 14. Volume 6. That's Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, page 14. And here in paragraph 3, in the middle of the paragraph, I read this. And it is the very hardest, sternest conflict which comes with the purpose and hour of great resolve and decision of the human to incline the will and way to God's will and God's way, relying upon the gracious influences which accompanied him all his life long. The man must do the work of inclining, for it is God which worketh in us both to will and do, and the character will determine the nature of the resolve and the action. The doing was not in accordance with the feeling or the inclination, but to know the will of our Father which is in heaven, follow and obey the leadings of the Holy Spirit. So what was that? The obeying to do the will of God was not according to the inclination of the flesh. It's contrary to that. It's a battle. And so the church, as it has to continue to conquer, and as each individual has to conquer the inroads of the flesh in manuscript, uh, rather, Ministry of Healing, page 453, paragraph 2, it says, the Christian life is a battle and a march. In this warfare, there is no release. The effort must be continuous and persevering. It is by unceasing endeavor that we maintain the victory over the temptations of Satan. Christian integrity must be sought with resistless energy and maintained with resolute fixedness of purpose. Does that sound like getting tired? If we lose slowly the love of God in redeeming us from our undone condition, we will find the Christian walk a burden. And the love that motivated me to carry that burden becomes unpleasant to me. I am sick of love. That's what the church said. 
because it's hard going. It's the path of the cross that Jesus walked. Oh dear, I've got to get out of bed. Oh dear, I've got to get make myself uncomfortable. No. And when it's too late, the love finally draws her to get out of there and he's gone. Self-indulgence. I'm so comfortable in my bed. I've taken off my garment. How can I put it on? I, I'm going to get my feet dirty. To do God's will. But it was because I love him. And he's standing at the door. He's still soliciting my love. But I'm sick of love. It's getting too much. Self-indulgence. Let me read it from Testimony, Volume 5. 5T, page 215. Sorry, yes, page 215. It says 5T, 215, paragraph 1. In this life we must meet fiery trials and make costly sacrifices. But the peace of Christ is the reward. There has been so little self-denial, so little suffering for Christ's sake, that the cross is almost entirely forgotten. What was the cross that brought us there, you see? We must be partakers with Christ of his sufferings if we would sit down and triumph with him on his throne. So long as we choose, now follow carefully, so long as we choose the easy path of self-indulgence and are frightened at self-denial, our faith will never become firm and we cannot grow, know the peace of Jesus nor the joy that comes through conscious victory. The most exalted of the redeemed host that stand before the throne of God and the Lamb, clad in white, know the conflict of overcoming, for they have come up through great tribulation. Those who have yielded to circumstances rather than engage in this conflict will not know how to stand in that day when anguish will be upon every soul, when though Noah Job and Daniel were in the land, they could save neither son nor daughter, for everyone must deliver his soul by his own righteousness. Oh. Self-indulgence is the problem. And so, in, the, in another page of page 183, paragraph 3, it says simply here, it should ever be kept before their minds that the Christian life is a constant warfare, that the indulgence of sloth or indolence will be fatal to success. We will become sick of love because of the indulgence, of self-indulgence and of... of uh, uh, not wanting any longer to fight the battle against the flesh. It's too hard. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then in verse 21 of Revelation 3, he says, He that overcomes will sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and sat with my Father in his throne. The overcomer, not the one who gets the knock on the door, but the one who will go to the door fast and open it and overcome his sloth, his self-indulgence, he will, together with Christ, conquer in the battle with self. So we've got to remember that love constraineth us. The mind must be relentlessly charged by the love sacrifice of God or we will sink into the bed of languid sleep when too late our lover is gone. 
may we become occupied with meditation upon the amazing love, keeping it always fresh in our minds so that the battle we have to fight with our sinful nature, with our sinful flesh, will be courageously fought because we are looking at our lover whom we love so much that we will sacrifice anything to be with him. This is our prayer and my prayer that we will not become sick of love as the Laodicean church has become. Amen.